What a great conference, isn't it? Yes. It's an awesome conference. Great keynote. I love seeing how things are getting easier from the Angular team. So it's wonderful. Thank you so much, Stephen and Rob. So I want you to all start off today with a little bit of a story from me. I'm going to have you close your eyes, which is a little bit scary at 9-ish AM on the last day of a conference. But bear with me. Imagine we're all back at work. We had a great time this week, but next week, the real world starts. We're back at work now. And you know, you're hanging out with your friends, you're coding some new Angular 6 application, you're just loving what you're working with, using some stack blitz. And then a production outage happens. Uh-oh. Man, I should have taken an extra day off, right? Stayed a little bit longer. So you start going through the process. You try to figure out what's the problem, what's the error. You start doing your debugging. So we dive in. And we figure out, after some time, where the problem is. And we see, through the Git history of our application, that something was removed from GitHub. Dear developer, we found this line of code. If you're reading this, there may be an outage. Uh-oh. We found our logs and they can crash the server when they're too full. If you remove the code, put it back. now. So you see something like this in there, and we look at this and go, well, okay, great, we found the problem, we can put the line of code back, but why did this happen? Why did this happen in the first place? Could we have prevented it? Could we have reduced the amount of time to get to this point in the first place? These unfortunate events are our lives. So my name is John Papa, and today I want to talk about readable code. It's a concept that I'm very passionate about. It's something that I think all of you will find that you do to the best of your abilities, but sometimes when we know something really well, we forget how important it is. We forget to dot the I's and cross the T's, right? So, where do we spend our time? How many of you here, raise a hand, think you spend more time writing code? I don't see a lot of hands. I don't see a lot of anything because there's a lot of bright lights, so. <laughs> I'm gonna assume nobody said that. I'll tell you our little secret in the developer industry. <laughs> when you talk, so your employers, prospective employers, and you ask your family, what do you do for a living? What do you say? I write code. <laughs> do you really? <laughs> Are we liars? The ratio is vastly in the camp of reading our code. Just ask Uncle Bob. There's been a lot of studies in this. So what can we do? I mean, even think about code reviews. We measure code reviews on the amount of time it takes to understand what's happening, don't we? This is what happens at work when Burke Holland writes code. <laughs> Burke's a great guy. So it's not about write code, it's not about being clever, crafty, artful. We always hear, hey, I wrote this really awesome thing. It's a nested ternary function. <laughs> and you're like, get out. <laughs> Reading code is about fast and effective communication. Have you ever had to read someone else's code? Have you ever wanted to chase them down? <laughs> Has that ever been you? <laughs> you want to care about the developer behind you. So think about it. Look at the developer behind you right now. You're writing code, you're out for a run, you're having a good day. Imagine the developer behind you looks more like this. <laughs> Readable code is the idea of making these things not happen so often. All right, so caring about our craft is a good thing, right? But caring about what happens after we deploy is really important. We like to write code. Yeah, yeah, we like to read code too. But after we deploy, who is going to maintain that? Sometimes it's you. Sometimes it's the person next to you. So what about the motivation for this? I mean, the productivity over time for a complete mess, I mean, this is what we get in a lot of our applications. Why do a lot of applications get rewritten? Because a lot of times people come into projects and can't figure out what's happening in the code base right now. So, hey, we say we're developers. We can write for Angular 6 now, right? It's a great time. It's a complete mess. Let's rewrite it. And we're sitting at home. We're like, yeah, let's go, you know? And you go tell your boss, hey, get good news. I can't read any of the code. Let's rewrite it. And they're like, no, don't think so. So how do you make your code easier to read? That's a, a really good question. Some of these things have been around for years and years, and some of these I think you'll find you do in the subconscious. So first, start with some kind of a style guide. The Angular docs provide one for us. 
Uh, we have several folks uh, contribute to this. And it's really nice because it gives us a lot of the common sense stuff, like the one I'm pointing, showing here is for naming conventions. That's stuff that you do in any language anywhere. It's not like these are Angular specific things for the most part. But they're important to have some kind of a guide. One of the first things people say to me when they say, hey, John, I love the original style guide you wrote. I say, thank you. The next sentence is almost always this. But I hated these three things. I'm sorry. So I made my own. And I'm like, don't hate on it. It's, that's great. That's the whole idea of a guide. Make what you want for your company. The important thing is you have something at your company and your team. So starting with those helps you avoid things like this. Writing a function to divide. Div x, y with the value. With somebody who goes and reads this, it's a lot easier if you can actually read the variable names and the functions. And it doesn't take a whole lot more energy. You think about this when you're writing your code. Not too bad. What about APIs for services in Angular? Using NGRX, maybe we do something like hero dispatchers, get heroes. Make the code easier. Oh, OK, it's going to go get my heroes. I'm going to open a snack bar and put a message and a title in there. Readable code makes a big difference. Now, we all know the cookie rule, right? You drop a cookie, you have five seconds to pick it up and eat it. Some of you, five seconds is more like this. One. So what do we do in the coding world? I have this rule I try to tell my developers on Teams. We have the five second rule in reading code, doing code reviews. If you can't understand the code in five seconds, that's probably a smell. That's probably an idea that you should refactor a little bit. So here, in five seconds, can you figure this out? One, two, three, four, five. No, you couldn't. So <laughs> instead, what you could do is rewrite it with functions in the middle. Just makes it a little bit easier. Abstracting to functions is an easy way to do this. And guess what? All modern tools have it. VS Code, you right click, extract this into a function, and you're good to go. Above the fold is something we hear in newspapers. But for most of you, that's a big piece of paper with news on it. I'm, I haven't seen those in years either. So newspapers say above the fold is important stuff should go. In coding, we have the similar kind of concept. The most important stuff should go first. In Angular, we put our properties and our methods up top. Then we put all of our stuff sometimes organized alphabetically, sometimes by events, sometimes we break them out by decorators or not. The point here is not so much how you do it and the fact that you have a consistent way of doing it to put the important information up top so you can read it, especially as files get longer. Organizing our code is important. Sometimes we have code for doing like an upsert, where you're doing updates and inserts in the same code. This code is arguably not too hard to read, but it could be easier. Why not just have an add speaker function and have an update speaker function and have something simpler that just calls those? Breaking things out into more functions, constant iteration. You want to look for other signs where you want to refactor for readability in your code as well. Less than 20 lines. This is a general guideline I have. It's not hard and fast, but if it's too big, and some people say it can't be off screen. Some people can't say more than 10 lines. It's really whatever your guidelines say in your company. It helps you read through the code faster. Once you get beyond this mark, though, you start seeing those signs of maybe my code is doing more than one thing. Maybe it's doing more than seven things. Maybe it's time to refactor out just a little bit. I worked at a company where people thought it was fun to misspell. And this is actual code. I'm not kidding. This is going to be actual code I saw at a company. And I had to literally pull this developer aside and go, what are you doing? And they were laughing the whole time. They're like, this is so funny. Let me share. You're like, who cares about misspellings, right? I'm Han Solo. Well, writing code, how many misspellings can we possibly put in five lines of code? I mean, seriously. <laughs> Abbreviations, misspellings. By the way, those are customers, not customers. <laughs> and my favorite one was here. I went looking through the code to maintain it, looking for any functions that did validation. So silly me, I searched for the word validate. <laughs> Little did I know that validate was actually spelled wrong all my entire life. These kind of things can actually hurt you in code. So spelling can be a good thing. Stay in school, kids. Maybe rewrite it something like this, readable code. People who maintain the code also lack the author's context. Have you ever seen someone's code and they, you look at it and it's clear to them, they're like, why are you so dumb? You can't figure this out. It's because sometimes the person who wrote it had the curse of knowledge. They knew something that you didn't, some key piece of information that dictated how they wrote that code. 
Context is clarity. For example, if you saw this movie, you know this was a key moment in the movie. Everybody in this here has probably seen except for Ward Bell, by the way. Make sure you make fun of Ward for not seeing Star Wars. <laughs> you won't miss him. So in this movie, this is the moment where he reveals that he is Luke's father. And this is a really important turning point. Spoiler! <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> now imagine the first time you saw this movie, Ward, you tuned in at this scene. You'd be like, yeah, who cares? There's some weird guy in a big black helmet telling me he's his dad. And the guy's like crying about it. Get over it. <laughs> in code, this is kind of important, right? So providing clarity through code first. Sometimes we look at comments as the way to go there. But I'll tell you, I think code is a better way. While this comment works, check if the hero can defeat the villains in Tour of Heroes. Hey, he's got more superpowers, but maybe she's got more energy, or maybe the villain is in monster mode, you know? We have to check to see who can defeat who. What happens if this logic changes and the comments don't? Because how often do you honestly update the comments when you change code? I know I don't. Instead, self-describing code, write a function. Hero can defeat villain. Little things like this, very easy to do, refactoring, abstracting, always opt for self-describing code over comments to describe a what. Replacing magic strings, arguably this isn't too hard to read, we got some nested strings in there, but it might be easier if we pull those strings out in a constants, might even get some code reuse, and then put those into our code, make it more readable code. Comments must be readable and maintained. They are technical debt. How often do you look at code and you see a comment and you're like, I have no idea what that's referring to. It's in the middle of nowhere. Someone else wrote it. I, it's probably from eons gone by. So when do you avoid comments? This is what I recommend. If you're explaining what the code does, here's the beginning of the if. Here's the end of the if. Thank you. <laughs> I was kind of confused. I thought the end if was the beginning, but now I know. Explaining, for example, at the beginning of the uh, conversation we talked about, we were imagining the production outage. What if it just said, hey, leave this code here? Great, why? Why do I leave it there? We go on further to explain. Outdated and incorrect, easy to understand. We don't want old comments. They're actually worse than having no comments because it misleads you down the wrong way. Or you shoulda, coulda, woulda use some kind of a well-named function or variable. Okay. Pick it on Burke, I think he tweeted it tweeted this morning, and I love this little quote. Code never lies, right? But sometimes developer, I mean, sometimes comments do. Sometimes comments will lie. So when do you use them? If it's explaining why something's there, some kind of unexpended consequence too. Or you're doing some kind of API docs, like with JS docs. That will clearly help you out with readable code. So there's times to use comments. For example, regex. Who here can actually read a regex that's more than three characters long? I mean, seriously, what do they say? You've got a problem, solve it with a regex. Now you have two problems. <laughs> Great place for a comment. In fact, I would do a function with a right name, like validate email, and put a comment in there saying, what the heck all those letters do? So and comments can be helpful, yes. I'm not saying don't comment at all. I'm just saying think about where you do comment and how it can be helpful and who's going to update that. Okay, so at this point, you're probably feeling a little bit sad, like I do a lot of those things. I do them too. Nobody's code is perfect when they first write it. But here's the thing. You write your code, it's dirty. And then you show it to somebody and you clean it up. Or you show it to yourself and you clean it up. And you iterate over it. You read your own code. Put your own code down for a day and go back. How often do you really understand what it did the day before? If you don't, that's a great sign that maybe you need to refactor to make it more readable and try some of these tips. So at the end of our story, dear developers, this is to all of you, writing readable code will make your app easier to maintain. It'll make it live longer. It'll make your bosses happier. It'll help you update your apps. It'll save you and the next developer. That might be you, might be somebody next to you as well. So here's some tips just to leave you some thoughts. The five second rule, it's really easy. We all know what it is by the cookie dropping on the floor. We can do that with our code too. Can you read it quickly, efficiently? If not, take another look. 
One thing per file. That's another guideline. One thing per function. Small functions in general. If you see nested ifs in a function, probably a case to refactor. If you see a lot of conditional logic, I generally look for branches in code. I don't want to have more than two inside of a function generally. Well thought out naming, probably the hardest thing to do in coding, right? But good names are worth the time that we invest in those. Crafting your own style guide, choosing comments wisely, and using tools like Prettier. Stop fighting over spaces and 80 line characters and where you should put the curly brace. Use tools like Prettier, set up a tool, uh, a um, Prettier RC file in your project, and just call it a day. Those things are much easier to handle and share it with your team. And if you want any links to some of these resources, the Angular Style Guide is right up here, brings you to the Angular site. VS Code does a lot of this stuff for you. Angular Essentials has a lot of this readable code stuff in it out of the box. I've got some code snippets in there that a lot of people use, uh, a couple million downloads on it. So thank you very much for, for using those. Helps you put things formatted right according to the CLI and the Style Guide. Also has Prettier baked in. And my favorite extension in the world, which is called Settings Sync. So you can set up your environment with your settings and extensions and share it with your entire team by checking into GitHub. And finally, since I always get asked, hey, what font was that? You can also check out my fonts in the theme called Winter is Coming. I use those also in the deck. So thank you very much for coming, and I hope you all write more readable code. <laughs>